Um, they did a good job with that. I've got one question though. Why is 29 the age that we don't grow past? You know, <laughs> the, I, don't, I don't know why 29 is that magic age. You know, you could be 100 years old and be, how old are you? 29. Why is 29 that age that we just cannot seem to pass? I don't understand that, but hey, happy 29th, Carmen. Um, and uh, good, good choice on song. That was, that was a good song this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Psalms chapter 137. Um, it's not Christmas, and I'm not preaching on Christmas. I don't want any confusion. Um, by the way, uh, for our visitors, this is how it goes around here. <clears throat> It's a little different, but stay with me. It'll all make sense in the end. Everything will make sense in the end. Um, I, I preach in a way that I hope to grab everybody's attention and keep you all the way through. And hopefully it's fun. We should enjoy digging into the Word of God. We should thoroughly enjoy it. It should not be something that we're ever bored with. I think it's a crime to bore people with the Word of God. So I try not to do that, but at the same time, we've got to grow deeper. God's word is there for us. Um, he wants us to grow deeper in that relationship with him. So let's go ahead and do that this morning. <clears throat> now that we're all in a spiritual mood. In 1957, Theodore Seuss Geisel created a character to help, pe help kids understand Christmas a little bit better. This character was given the name the Grinch, which is part grouch and part pinch. See, you're all growing deeper already, aren't you? I didn't know, but here we go. Now we have more information there. Part grouch and part pinch. And we're all familiar with the Dr. Seuss story of how the Grinch stole Christmas. But the word Grinch is not just the name of a character in a Dr. Seuss story. It's been added to the dictionary and it's now an actual word with an actual definition. And we have Dr. Seuss to thank for this. But his actual word now, you can look it up in the dictionary. The word Grinch means someone or something that spoils or dampens the joy of others. That's what the word Grinch means. So today I'd like to speak to, on the biblical account of the Grinch. And I know you probably didn't know he was in the Bible, but he is. And I don't want to show you where he's at here. King David met the Grinch when he wrote Psalms chapter 51 and verse 12. So let's look at this verse. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. <clears throat> Since the definition of the word Grinch is someone or something that spoils or dampens the joy of others, we clearly have the Grinch in Christmas or in, in the Bible. It's, he's right there. And you're welcome for that. Just in case you were looking for the Grinch in the Bible, there it is right there. So there, now, see how we're growing deeper already? Um, by the way, that's not the depth I want to go. I want to go a lot deeper in the Word of God this morning. David's joy was dampened by something, which by definition is a Grinch, or is the Grinch. And every one of us have encountered a time in our lives where we just didn't feel like giving thanks. Our joy was just gone. Now, I had the choice. I, I thought about it this week, and I thought, you know, I could preach a Thanksgiving message on all the reasons we have to give thanks. But there are a lot of people that go through life, and they don't feel like giving thanks. They're just at a place where they just, they don't feel thankful right now, and it's hard to give thanks because their joy is gone. And maybe they're going through a time of um, health issues, or maybe it's some other negative time in their life. But when it comes down to being thankful, they're just not feeling it. And that's, that's an actual thing that happens to us. So I thought this morning, you know, maybe we should address that. Because something sneaks in every once in a while and steals our heart of thanksgiving. And, and if we're all honest, we understand that that happens. It, yeah, sometimes we just don't feel like being thankful. Now we're still appreciative of everything that God has done. And we still trust in God. We still have faith. But somehow we just lost that joy and that thankful heart. It just somehow, somehow went away. And we just don't feel like being thankful. Our circumstances have become so big <clears throat> that they end up receiving our undivided attention and we become overwhelmed. Now I think everybody in here can at least look back. Hopefully you're not going through a time like that. But if you are, then you're, un then you're connecting already. Yep, I get it. I'm going through it right now. But maybe you can at least... Remember a time that you went through that you, where you didn't feel like you could really give thanks because you weren't feeling very thankful. Some things you don't give, you, you're not thankful for. 
In 2011, we lost our daughter. That's not something I thank God for. But the Bible doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says in everything give thanks. So I'm able to give thanks in that. And I, and I want to and I want to dig deeper on this topic right here. What do you do when you just don't feel like giving thanks? You don't. It, you, it, you're just not feeling it. The Grinch, whatever that may have been in your life, had stolen Thanksgiving. Maybe it's our, Maybe it's doing it right now. Maybe you're just not feeling thankful right now. The holiday season is here, and for some people, those are the roughest times to go through is the holidays because there's some negative connection that connects you to the holidays, and it's hard to get through that. So today I would like to show you how the Grinch stole Thanksgiving and how you can get that back because we need to be thankful. We need to have a, we need to have a thankful heart. The book of Psalms is a book of songs. That's what the book of Psalms is. It, these are the songs that the Israelites sang. It's basically their hymn book. They, the, all the Psalms, when you read through the book of Psalms, you see one song after another listed. <clears throat> but I want to show you the one song that grabbed my attention this past week. It's a song about not singing. And that sounds like a good song, doesn't it? It's a song about not singing. It's a song that was sung about not singing a song. It's like having a recipe teaching you how not to make something. You know, it, it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. This is a song that was sung about not singing a song. And a song about not singing is filled with uh, irony, but nonetheless we have one. So let's go ahead and look at this psalm this morning. Psalms 137 verse 1. Let's look at this verse. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. It starts out pretty exciting, doesn't it? <clears throat> we're, we're crying. That's the beginning of the song right here. It's a song about when the children of Israel were in Babylonian captivity. They're, they're no longer in their home. They've been taken captive, and now they are in Babylon. They're taken away from everything they know and everything that they love. And they're now looking back on what they could have had if they had only obeyed God, but they would not obey God and God allowed them to go into captivity. So they're looking back, realizing what they could have had if they would have just obeyed God, but they rejected God and now they're in captivity. And it says that they remembered Zion. They're sitting by the rivers of Babylon and they're weeping over their loss. And it says that they hung their harps upon the willows. They're done singing. They've retired their harps. They just hang them up and these people are miserable. This is the situation where Israel is when this, the time of this psalm or what this song is about. Now they could be praising God because there's always time to praise and thank God. He's always worthy of our praise and he's always worthy of our thanksgiving. But they just weren't feeling it. They're in captivity. And the Grinch of their captivity had stolen their thanksgiving. But what happens next tells us that these Israelites must have been really bummed out. They're not just having a bad day. They are really bummed out. They're so devastated that the Babylonians couldn't take it anymore. So you got the Israelites, they're crying, and the Babylonians, the people that took them into captivity, can't take it anymore. They, they won't cheer up. These guys are really bummed out. The Babylonians are losing their mind. We, we, something's got to fix this. You know, they're, they're, they're so miserable. So they wanted to cheer the Israelites up, so they offer a suggestion. Look at verse 3. For there, those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. The Babylonians are asking the Israelites to sing a song. They want to hear mirth, which means rejoicing or joy. Uh, I, we, want to, we want to see you smile again. And, and isn't it interesting that the captors are really feeling bad for the captives? Like, wow, you guys are really bumming us out. Sing a song. D -d -d smile. We're, we're starting to feel bad that we took you, took you away because now we're getting bummed out. Now, I, and I find that funny, but God threw it in there. So you might as well enjoy it. The Babylonians are looking at the Israelites like, wow, that's, that's really depressing. So they're, they're going up to the Israelites and they say, can you sing us a song? Sing us a song. And they said, not only sing us a song, but sing us a song of Zion. 
why don't you go ahead and sing a song of Zion? And now this goes against the Babylonian religion altogether. They are, they're trying so hard to cheer these guys up that they're telling them to sing a song about their own God. Not the one of the Babylonian gods. No, go ahead and sing about the God that you believe in. It's okay. Aren't you trying to switch our culture? Aren't you trying to change us and make us Babylonians? Yes, but you're really bummed out. And we can't take it. Go ahead and sing a song about your God. It's, it's okay. Just sing a song about Zion. Go ahead and do that. But the suggestion itself seems to bum them out even more. You see, Zion wasn't just a name of a hill in Jerusalem. Zion was considered to be the dwelling place of God. They're not just crying because they're missing the hill. They're crying because they're separated from the dwelling place of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. <laughs> it says, Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Zion represented God's presence. It's not just a place. It's not just a hill. It represents God's presence. And the Israelites have found themselves in a place where they feel distant from God. They feel distant from the presence of God and they were missing Zion. Now look at their response to the Babylonians' suggestion. Sing a song about Zion. Go ahead. Go ahead and sing one of those songs. Look at their response in verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We can't, we can't sing. We have no song to sing. We're in a foreign land. How do we sing songs of praise and thanksgiving when, thanksgiving when we just don't feel His presence? We don't feel like God's near us. We left Him way back there and now we're separated from the presence of God. How do we experience thanksgiving when we're not in a place where we can feel thankful? How do we sing a song about Zion when we're in a foreign land? Sometimes thanksgiving feels foreign when our circumstances seem less than desirable. And it's hard to give thanks when you're going through a rough time. And our circumstances become the Grinch who spoils or dampens our joy. Easily, the circumstance itself becomes the Grinch. And it spoils or it dampens the joy of someone else. And sometimes we don't experience Thanksgiving again until those circumstances improve. And we miss out on so much when we can't give thanks in the hard times. We're missing out on so much there. And if you're going through a Grinch-like circumstance, or at least you can relate to a Grinch-like circumstance, I would like to show you what the perfect time is for Thanksgiving and how you can get that Thanksgiving back. So maybe you're going through a rough time right now, and maybe you're thinking, yeah, I'd like to have it back. I just, I don't know what to do to get it back right now. But yes, I'd like to be able to give thanks. In Matthew chapter 14, Herod prom King Herod promises to give his niece anything she wants <coughs> because he was pleased with the way that she danced before him for his birthday. So she says, or so King Herod says, you can have anything you want. Just ask and it's yours. And what she requested was horrific. This girl asked for the head of John the Baptist to be delivered to her on a platter. Happy birthday. This, this is what she says. I want the head of John the Baptist. Bring the head of John the Baptist to me on a platter. And Herod kept his word and she got what she wanted. Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 10. So he sent and had John the Baptist, or John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. John the Baptist wasn't only the one who cried out, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. He's not just the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He's also Jesus' cousin. This is Jesus. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist's disciples just told Jesus that his cousin was murdered. And Jesus loved him. And now he's grieving. Now Jesus is grieving over the loss of a dear friend and family member. My cousin just got killed in prison. And this is, a de this is definitely a place where a person would have a hard time giving thanks. This, this would be a rough one. Jesus' heart is broken and he just wants to be alone. So that's what Jesus sets out to do. Look at verse 13. When Jesus heard it, 
he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. Jesus just wants to be by himself. He needs a little bit of time to process the news and to grieve. He just lost his cousin. John the Baptist was just killed. And he needs a little bit of time to process this information and to grieve. But it says when the people found out where he was, they all start coming out of the woodwork because they, they want him to meet their needs. They want Jesus to take care of the needs that they have. And we often miss this, but Jesus' broken heart over the murder of his cousin is actually the beginning to the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Look at the next verse with me. <clears throat> verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. When Jesus sees the brokenness and the desperation of all these people, it says he was moved with compassion. His heart went out to these people. They were sick. They needed healing. And his heart goes out to these people. And he sets aside what's burdening him. And he reaches out to help them with what's burdening them. But he's still, he's still in a deserted place and he's still in a place of grieving. But there's not enough food to feed everybody. And the disciples come up to him and said, hey, maybe we should send him away. Let him go get some food. There's not enough food. And a new problem of hunger has now crept into the scenario. You got thousands of people here and they're hungry people. And the disciples say, let's let them go home. Let's let them go and get some food because they're really hungry. So the disciples suggest that Jesus sends them away, but Jesus then answers this problem with another problem. Jesus does that sometimes. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this problem and I'm going to add another problem to it. Look at verse 16. <coughs> but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Jesus just told the disciples to feed the crowd. Now the disciples are responsible to solve the problem that they just told Jesus about. Isn't that awesome when God gives you a problem to answer a problem? Hey, these people are hungry. There's over 5,000 people here, Jesus. Let's go ahead and send them home. And Jesus says, oh no, don't send them home. You feed them. You go ahead, you feed them. So the disciples answer that problem with another problem. They tell, they tell Jesus that we only have five loaves and two fish. We have one lunch. We have five loaves, and we're, not, we're talking biscuit size. We're not talking, you know, wonder bread packages. We're, we're talking small loaves of bread, barley loaves, and two fish. Go ahead and feed them. We only have five loaves and two fish. That's all we have. And Jesus says, well, bring those to me. Now, while all this is going on, let's not forget that Jesus is suffering with a broken heart because he just got the news of John the Baptist. We can't separate these two stories because they're happening at the same time. Try to lock these in. This is what's going on behind the scenes of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus went there to be alone. Everybody has come and said, hey, we need you to heal our sick. We are, you know, our kids are dying. We need you to help us. Jesus has a heart of compassion for these people and he heals their sick. And then the disciples say, hey, they're hungry. Let them go. And Jesus says, you feed them. Go ahead and feed them. But we only have five loaves and two fish. While all of this is happening, Jesus has a broken heart. Remember, he went there to grieve because he just lost his cousin. Don't forget what's happening in the background of this story. He's personally suffering and literally Thousands of people are asking him to give attention to their problems. Now, this would be one of those times when giving thanks would be foreign. Uh, I'm telling you, when I'm going through a rough time and, you know, I've already blown, you know, I popped all the balloons for my pity party and I'm sitting there and I'm ready to just be alone. I don't want people coming up to me and say, hey, I need you to fix my problem. But he's got thousands, literally thousands of people. Hey, can you fix my problem? Nobody's asking him how his day is going. Nobody's asking him what's going on in his mind. He's grieving over the loss of his cousin. He just lost his cousin. 
and everybody else has a problem that they need him to address. The circumstances would easily cover over the feeling of joy and thanksgiving. And I think we all understand that. This is a time to be bummed out. <clears throat> if anything could be a Grinch, this would be it. This would steal a joy. But Jesus wasn't about to let this specific Grinch steal his thanksgiving. Look at verse 19. <coughs> Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. And they all ate and were filled. And, took, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Jesus just performed a miracle that fed over 5,000 people with five small fish or five loaves and two fish. By the way, that's a God solution, not our solution. If your kids say we're out of food, don't tell them to multiply it. It won't work. Now, I'm hungry. They're always hungry, by the way. <coughs> and it only seems like the only way to multiply it is to go to the store. God, God did something nobody else can do. A miracle is something only God can do. And God performs a miracle here. He just feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish and multiplies that till everybody's full and they're able to bring 12 baskets full of leftovers back. But before he does it, it says that Jesus made a move that was completely unnatural. He thanked God. He stops everything and he thanks God. The word bless, when it says that he blessed and he broke the bread means to thank or to praise. And he didn't wait until the miracle showed up. He thanked God for the five loaves and the two fish. He doesn't stop and say, thank you for feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. No, he thanks God for the five loaves and the two fish. That's when the thanksgiving comes. Not after the miracle happens, but right now. He thanks God for the five loaves and the two fish. He thanked God when there wasn't enough to take care of the problem. Now that's an important detail. And yes, Jesus knew what he was about to do, but all the people saw was that he's thanking God in the middle of the problem and not when the problem was over. Everybody standing there watching, Jesus thanked God for the five loaves and two fish. Now if I'm one of the guys in the crowd, I'm like, yeah, sure, he's thankful. He's got lunch. He got five loaves and two fish up there. He's going to be fine. But what about the rest of us? But he stops and he says, hey, I want to thank you for the five loaves and two fish. Jesus knew what was about to happen, but everybody else sees him thanking God in the middle of the problem. Not when the problem's solved, but when the problem still exists. And Jesus was facing a Grinch just like everybody faces from time to time. Remember, he's still grieving. And there was clearly an opportunity here for joy to be spoiled or dampened. Definitely. This would be a time to grieve. He was in a place where Thanksgiving would be hard to find for most people. This would be a time when you wanted to be alone and he was trying to be alone. It just didn't work out. 5,000 people showed up. But he's trying to be alone. And he's trying to take some time to grieve over the loss of his cousin. This would be a time when it's hard to be thankful. But Jesus knew something that most people never fully realize. Zion is not just a place. It's a presence. <clears throat> Maybe you should write that down. Zion is not just a place. It's a presence. And Jesus understood this. Remember the Israelites were devastated because they felt like they were distant from God? Yeah, we, we remember Zion, but it's left way out there, and now we're in a foreign land. How do we sing songs about Zion when we're so distant from Zion? <coughs> they were weeping because they believed Zion was just a place and that God wasn't even close to them in the middle of their circumstances. I, we feel alone here. We feel distant from God. How do we sing songs of thanksgiving when God's so far away from us? Jesus was also in a desolate, desolate place. Uh, we, we can see that in the story. He was going through a devastating time. But somehow he was able to give thanks when things were still dismal. 
How do you do that? You know those times when you just don't feel like giving thanks? Jesus somehow found a way to give thanks when you don't feel like giving thanks. If I were to invite you over to my house and I were to say, hey, make yourself at home, kick off your shoes, kick up your feet, and just enjoy the time. Everybody come to my house and let's just have a time of food and fellowship. And you come in and we're talking for a while, we're having a good time, and then you decide to sit down at the table. Everybody sits at the table and I say, hey, I'm going to go get the food, I'll be right back. Now you all have a bowl sitting in front of you at the table. You're like, all right, he's going to bring something, we can fill our bowl and we're going to have some food. And this is what I bring out. I bring this back to the table. This is baking powder for all your favorite baking recipes. I read that right off of here. This is, this is baking powder. And I bring this to the table and I open this thing up and I pour it in each one of your bowls. And you have a spoon there. And then I sit down and I thank God for the food. And when I'm done praying, I'm like, go ahead and eat. How thankful are you? Not much. Not a whole lot Thanksgiving here. Like you invited us, so we're starving. We, we would like some food. Oh, go ahead and eat it. Go, go ahead and help yourself. Eat it. And there's, there's plenty more where that came from. Enjoy. How thankful are you at this moment? Not too thankful. It's hard to be thankful when you realize you're about to eat a bowl of baking powder. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Thank you for the baking powder. Please nourish my body with it. Help it not do things I don't want it to do. You know, you, th it's a hard thing to give thanks for, right? You're, you're in a baking powder situation and you're not really thankful for it. Sometimes God presents you with a baking powder style scenario though. Sometimes that's what you get. It's bitter and it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. And it creates new problems if you eat a bowl of baking powder. But that's what you got. And sometimes God gives you a scenario like that right there. And it doesn't really seem like one of those times where praising is the proper response. Well, I'm not happy about this. If there was only a way for us to step back and see all of the other ingredients that God wants to add to that one ingredient because he's got a bigger plan and a bigger recipe to make something bigger happen in your life, but this just happens to be one of the essential ingredients that you need for him to bring this blessing out in your life and help you become the person he wants you to be. If only we could see what he was going to add to that baking powder scenario and see that he's cooking up something in our life that's going to be absolutely amazing, we might be able to give thanks. If we could actually see it for what it really was. That's just one horrible ingredient to making something beautiful out of my life. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Sometimes the baking powder is essential for what God is preparing for us. Now I'm telling you, if you come to my house and I pour bacon powder in your bowl, Thanksgiving isn't your first thought. I'm not thankful. And when God allows life circumstances to seem like that, immediately we're not thankful. We don't want to go through those times. It's rough. We're not appreciating it. <laughs> now, I, know you're, you're, I know you're in control here, but did you know that's baking powder? I don't, like, I don't like what you've given me, God. I don't like my scenario. But even in those times, we can give thanks. We can give thanks because we know that's just one ingredient. And he's bringing the rest to add to it. You want this in your life. When it comes to cake and everything else, you want this. You just don't want a bowl of it. And when all God does is hand you baking powder, realize this is just one ingredient. And I need to learn and I need to handle this circumstance the way I, I need to because this is just one ingredient to something masterful that he's doing in my life. And I just need to recognize this and thank God in this also. 
even when we, all we have is five loaves and two fish and a problem that's 5,000 times bigger, <clears throat> we can still praise God knowing that it's just one ingredient to a bigger plan. We can still thank God. But let's be real for a minute. Sometimes it feels like God is so distant from us when we're going through a Grinch-style circumstance. Sometimes it feels like he's so far away and we don't even know how to get back to him. And yes, we know he has a plan, <clears throat> but it feels like he's somewhere else. It feels like he's so far away. Sometimes we just feel like we're alone in what we're going through. And sometimes it feels like Zion or the presence of God is nowhere to be found. Like, God, I got lost. I know you didn't leave me, but I think I've left you. I am lost. I don't know where you're at. I feel so alone in my life and I'm going through so much and I'm having a hard time thanking you or giving thanks in my situation. And we know that he has a plan, but we don't know where we fit on that priority list. We feel like we're way down on that priority list. And it almost seems like he doesn't know our pain or he would do something about it. I want to share with you a childhood memory of mine <clears throat> that changed my world. And I believe it will help you understand where I'm going with this. I don't remember how old I was, but I'll never forget the event and I'll never forget what I learned from the event. My mom had just told my brother to go clean his room. Go clean your room. And my brother decided to make the granddaddy of all bad decisions. He looked at my mom and said, no. Like, oh, that was a bad, bad move. Now she turned to him. You know that slow turn that moms do? The snap is scary too when they turn around at you real quick. But the slow turn, almost it's agonizing. It's, it almost feels like eternity. She s slowly turns and says, what? You know, like there's a comma between every word. What did you say? Now as the older brother, I'm sitting there thinking, she just gave you another chance, buddy. You told her no, but she just said, what did you say? This is the time where you beg and grovel and plead. Say, sorry, mom. I was wrong. I told you no. I apologize. Please forgive me. I'm going to go clean my room now. That's the proper response. But that's not what he did. Now he didn't choose that. He looked at my mom. I, we were just little kids too. Really, really little kids. And I'm standing there thinking, what are you going to do? What's going to happen? And he looks at my mom and he does this. I said no. I'm like, all right, you're a dead man. It's over. It's over. And I'm watching this whole thing go down like, oh, what's going to happen? Now, my mom and dad never spanked out of anger. They never disciplined us when they were angry. Because disciplining comes from the same word as disciple, is to teach and to train. It's not a punishment. It's a discipline. Sometimes punishment is discipline. But they chose never to do it in anger. So my mom said, you go sit in the living room on the couch and wait till your father gets home. And I'm like, oh, that's also, that's agonizing. So my brother goes to the living room and he's sitting on his couch, on this couch, and he's waiting for dad to come home. Now I have responsibilities as an older brother. And my responsibility, as older siblings know, is to torment the younger sibling. <laughs> so I decide I'm going to go in there and I'm going to heap things on top of this situation. So I go in there and I sit down by my brother on the couch and I look at him and I'm like, did you know we used to have 12 children in our family? <laughs> We're down to four. You know what happened to the other eight? They told mom no. <laughs> now my brother's sitting there sweating. You're like, oh no. Like, they're gone. You didn't even know about them. They did what you did. And he's sweating. In the meantime, my dad comes home while we're sitting on the couch just, and I'm, I'm tormenting my brother. My dad comes home and we hear him talking to my mom in the kitchen. And I look at my brother and I'm like, this is it. This is the last conscious thing you ever get to do. And my brother decided to make another move and he got up and he ran out the door. 
And I'm thinking, that's granddaddy number two. First, you don't tell mom no. And second, you don't run away from a parent when you're in trouble. And he ran out. Now, my mom is telling my dad all about what he did and how she can't handle it. And she says, would you please go in there and deal with your son sitting on the couch? Now, there's one piece of information that my dad did not get. The name of the son sitting on the couch. She didn't, he, she didn't give him that piece of information. So when my dad turns the corner, he looks at the couch and I'm like, oh no. Oh no. He looks at me and I'm like, dad, no, it wasn't me. And he goes, of course it wasn't you. It's never you. And I realize I've used that one too many times. <laughs> And he says, don't say another word because if you open your mouth again, that spanking's going to be a, so much worse. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm a dead man. I can't defend myself. I can't do anything. It's the longest walk up those stairs to go to my bedroom that I ever had in my life. And I get up to my bedroom and my dad says, bend over. And I look at my dad's eyes and I see what I only interpret as anger. And he says, bend over. And I'm like, I can't do anything about this. I can't even defend myself. My dad gave me a spank and I will never, ever forget. He warmed me up. The greatest spanking I've ever received in my life. And then after he was done spanking me, my dad always sat us on the bed next to us, next to him, and he, he put his arm around us and he talked to us about what we did, how God loves us, and then he prays with us. So he puts his arm around me and says, you know what you got spanking for, right? And I said, no. No. And you could tell, oh, I can't believe you didn't learn your lesson. I'm like, Hold, Dad, can I say something? Like, what? It wasn't me. <laughs> Caleb, my brother, he ran, he ran out the door when he heard you come and I was sitting on the couch when you turned the corner and you thought it was me and you just spanked me for what he did. And my dad got real quiet and looked at me and says, you stay right here. And he went downstairs to talk to my mom. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what's going to happen now. <laughs> I have no clue. He comes back upstairs a few minutes later. And that scary sound that all those kids remember when the belt comes out of the belt loops, pop, 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 he pulls his belt out again. I'm like, oh, no. I don't know what happened down there, but I'm getting around too. And he hands me that belt. And my dad bends over the bed. And he says, you go till you're finished. And you spank me until you're done. I was wrong. And I didn't get all the information. You go till you're finished. And I'm standing there with a belt thinking, yeah, nah. <laughs> my mom didn't raise no fool. Well, one of them, but he ran out of the house. <laughs> I am not doing this to my dad. And I sat the belt down and said, Dad, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he looked at me and I saw that same look in his eye that I saw before he spanked me. Before and after my dad spanked me, I saw something I'll never forget. My dad was hurting. My dad was really hurting. And I understood why he he would feel bad after he spanked me because it wasn't my fault. But I, couldn't, I never realized that he was hurting every time he spanked me. Because that look that I interpreted as anger at the beginning of the spanking was my dad hurting before he spanked me. And it was the same look that he had after he spanked me. He was hurting. That look that I thought was anger was actually suffering. Because my parents never spanked us out of anger. <clears throat> they spanked us because it was vital in helping us grow up to be godly. It was this. We didn't enjoy it. We didn't want to go through it. It was rough. And I always knew how a spanking affected me, but not until that day did I know how it affected my dad. Every time I received a spanking, it felt like the baking powder situation. I felt like a place of desolation. I felt like my father didn't understand. 
and that he was distant from me. You remember those times. But it changed my life when I saw that he went through the suffering with me. It really did hurt him more than it hurt me. He actually was suffering when he spanked me. Zion is not just a place, it's a presence. And God is never far away. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When circumstances become a grinch, which dampens your joy, give thanks. Give thanks. God's going through it with you. When your heart is broken, so is his. He's going through that with you. He loves you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. When you're going through that rough time, remember he's going through that rough time too. He's going through it with you. The Israelites wept because they thought God was distant, but he was right there with them the entire time because Zion is not just a place, it's a presence. And God is with you through everything all the time. And Jesus was able to give thanks because he knew this. Yeah, I'm going through a rough time. It doesn't feel like a thankful time. But I want to thank you for the five loaves and the two fish. I want to thank you when it's not quite enough. Because I know this is only one ingredient to what you're cooking up. And I want to give thanks. God will never leave you. And he's always going to go through everything with you. And when it seems like you're going through a Grinch-type situation, stop and praise Him that it's just the baking powder that's needed for a bigger plan. And when you feel like the Grinch trumps Thanksgiving, you can still be thankful that God always trumps Grinch. Always. Stand with me this morning.